It is indeed a great pleasure uh, to be here today. And it is a special honor because I am fully cognizant of the fact that not too far away, there is the funeral for Robert Strauss, who indeed was a giant and who has left his legacy here. I would like in my own way to see if I could explore with you the, the depth of his commitment as exemplified in an effort to bridge two disciplines. The discipline of law and the discipline of international relations. It's not easy to be able to bridge two disciplines. And of course, the center is dedicated to the virtues of an interdisciplinary approach. But before one can understand the virtues of an interdisciplinary approach, one must really appreciate, I believe, the perils of approaching problems, especially in the international sphere, by looking at them narrowly. And yet, each discipline tends to develop its own culture. Whichever discipline you are in, I am sure that you are aware of that fact. When I was at the American Enterprise Institute, they had two floors, one for the economists and one for the people that did public policy. They hardly ever talked to each other. They couldn't bridge their differences. When I studied international law, first at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, given my interest in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and later at Yale University where I did my doctorate, it wasn't easy because faculty members and other students would say to you, you're studying public international law, what is that? We understand private international law, that involves transactions, that's, that's real law. So you would get it from the law faculty that somehow international law, public international law, relations between states was all so mushy, without any judge, that it wasn't really law. And you got no solace from the other community. The ones that did foreign policy, or the ones that did political science, because they said, you're still involved in law. You don't understand the entire gamut of a scientific approach that we political scientists use. Now, Yale Law School tried its best to bridge that gap. And Yale Law School was known for adopting what they called the contextualist approach. But it had its difficulties. And I thought that what I would do today is to try to explain the difficulties and opportunities in navigating between international law, international affairs, and the uses of American law as practiced in courtrooms, or its application in courtrooms. And I thought I would begin a long time ago, it seems. I think it's going to be almost 50 years since I entered NYU Law School, and tell you about something that perplexed me and has perplexed me ever since, because I see it being played out in the approach to different international problems. When I went to NYU Law School, I started in 1966, and I would like to go to the bookstore. And the bookstore had two nicely framed epigrams. One was rather conventional for Abraham Lincoln, it was, it was a statement by Abraham Lincoln that the law, that what a lawyer does is give his time and advice, and that a lawyer's time and advice are his stock in trade. Well, that's fine. You can put it up in your law office, ask clients to pay because you're giving them your time and advice. And many students bought that. But then there was this other sign, this framed epigram by Edmund Burke, who you may know was a uh, famous Scottish uh, first attorney, philosopher, statesman in the 18th century. And it read, the law 
sharpens the mind by narrowing it. And I was watching all these students. They were sort of walking up there, and they said, I want to buy that. I want to put that up in my dorm. And I sort of leaned back, and I said, I don't really get it. Sharpens the mind. Do I really want a sharp mind? Yes. But do I want a sharp mind at the expense of it being a very narrow mind? I don't, I don't think so. So I began to study my, uh, my schoolmates, who was going in what direction. And I noticed that there was a particular type that tended to really like this sign. I can't say I was a sociologist, but I guess that the ones that really liked this sign were the ones that saw themselves as being hotshot prosecutors or maybe hotshot defense lawyers. Because when you're, in a, when you're a prosecutor, you tend to operate, not as scholars, you tend really to operate in a field where there is guilt or innocence. There's not a lot of gray in between. And there's not a lot of gray in between if you have a narrow but sharp mind. But I want to try to deal today and engage you in discussion about the perils and opportunities in both having a sharp mind and an unsharp mind. So let me, I've never done this before, by the way. This is a trial run. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, let me try to do this as a PowerPoint instead of reading a formal talk. So if I have misspellings, etc., please forgive me. It's my first day. Okay. So here's the question that began to consume me back in 1966 as a law student. Is a sharp but narrow mind a virtue or a vice? And I garner to say that if you went before various bar associations and you took a poll of individuals, it, it might very well be very much divided. Now, I thought it might be useful to illustrate what I consider to be some of the perils of having a narrow mind when it comes to thinking seriously about international problems, international crises, like what's going on in terms of the challenge that the United States faces today in dealing with Crimea and how to respond to President Putin. For me, it has shades of the controversy that existed over Vietnam when I was a law student. Remember, we had a situation in which the North entered the South, the North crossed what was recognized as an international boundary, but the North said that, well, we're really one country. Russia says, Crimea, us, we're really one country. In fact, even the Ukraine, we all come from the same roots, but certainly Crimea, given its Russian-speaking population majority, is all one. Uh, and we asked ourselves during the Vietnam crisis, why should the United States care about something that might be aggression between the North and the South where they have a dispute? There must be disputes like this all over the place. Hundreds of countries that have difficulties with breakaway regions, is the United States going to get involved? I mean, why do we care? And the answer was, that we care because it's not just about the North going into the South. It's not about North Vietnam and South Vietnam. It's perhaps not about Russia going into Crimea as such. It's about its implications. And with Vietnam, <coughs> the thought was that if North Vietnam was successful in the South, it might be a precursor to other things, but only if you looked at it in the overlay, because nobody really believed that if North Vietnam was going to be successful in reuniting itself with the South, that it was then going to use that as a spring point, spring point for going elsewhere throughout Southeast Asia. It was only because we believed the leading lights at the time. My former professor, who I revere very much, and dean of the Yale Law School for 10 years, Eugene Rostow, who was the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs under Lyndon B. Johnson, and has written about this a lot, that it was being masterminded by Russia and by China, and that was what was at stake was preventing a communist ideology 
from subverting the new rules of international order. It wasn't between us and Hanoi. It was between us and Beijing and Moscow. Otherwise, why bother? Why invest this enormous treasure? And we had a lot of international lawyers of that mindset during that era. More were in government than at any other point in history, in US history. Nicholas D. Katzenbach, great international lawyer too, was the Attorney General. Dean Rusk was the Secretary of State. He was not an international lawyer by profession, but you know, there's a Dean Rusk School in Atlanta, Georgia. It's named after him because he believed in international law. It was in his soul. And you had Walt Rostow, Eugene's brother, who was then the head of the National Security Council, and thought very much in similar veins. Henry Kissinger didn't think that way. Henry Kissinger thought that you really have to keep law out of the equation. Don't talk about aggression. Don't talk about self-defense. Don't talk about Article 51, Article 52 of the Charter, especially if you're talking about great powers. In fact, it doesn't make sense to even talk about it at all because at that point, during the Cold War, everything was about great powers. You, file, you fell under the protection of either the Soviets or under the protection of the United States. And he said, the truth is, especially if you're dealing with great powers, we're in the same boat. You know, you may not like the person that you have to share an apartment building with. He may be violating rules about sanitation or the like, but you have to live with him. And you can't get rid of him, so find a way. And Kissinger elevated this, in his own phrase, into an art. He called it the art of creative diplomacy, which is about finding outcomes. And he recently wrote a piece that appeared in the Washington Post in which he talked about the Ukraine. And if you read what he says, because it's a little difficult to read his verbiage sometimes, carefully, you know that it's a retread of the old debate about Vietnam. As he begins by saying, public discussion today on Ukraine is all about confrontation. Well, confrontation is another word for accountability. You're the aggressor, we're the good guys, you did something wrong, you have to be punished. Accountability. Let me just say a word, parenthetically, about the word accountability, because accountability is now the key word in, uh, in criminal law. Somebody does something wrong, court-martial, you hold that person to account. The original word, is holding accounts, like an accountant has accounts because it's important just to know facts. And then it gradually elevated in the English language usage from the French account to the more British account as an explanation. And then finally it went from explanation to retribution of sorts. Well, Kissinger says Ukraine really shouldn't be about confrontation. It shouldn't be about accountability. Our only concern should be about how it all ends. And he says, I have seen four wars begin with great enthusiasm and public support. All of which we did not know how to end. And from three of which we withdrew unilaterally. Four wars begin with great enthusiasm and public support. The day after, it was noticed publicly that there were Russian troops without insignias, as they're required under international law, in Crimea. The Wall Street Journal ran as its lead editorial the following under this banner headline, Act of War. Well, Kissinger um, would have thought that was very ill-advised because you can't get any stronger language about confrontation than Act of War it puts you into a box. And if you don't respond militarily effectively, then you're perceived as weak. So you end up going one step forward and four steps backwards. And the New York Times carried an editorial, lead editorial, act of aggression. So this is what Kissinger wrote in his own way about that. He said that the West must understand that Russia, that to Russia, 
Ukraine can never be just a foreign country. We have to negotiate a resolution, and foreign policy is the art of negotiating a compromise with the ultimate aim as reconciliation. Instead, we have the demonization of Vladimir Putin, but that is not policy. That is an absence of one. By contrast, to be fair, yesterday, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright had her own very long op-ed piece in which she essentially took issue with Kissinger's view, uh, said, quote, that what we have is nothing less than aggression, quote, aggression that has broken international law, and that although he often talks about an analogy to Kosovo, that is simply not true, quote, because in the 1990s, international interventions in the Balkans were approved, contributed to, and governed by large numbers of states in many institutions and informal arrangements, including the UN Security Council. There's one problem with that. It's not true. The UN Security Council never authorized military action or never explicitly authorized Lawyers are in the business of construing things how they want, but it never explicitly authorized it. And Russia was shocked, because if it thought it had been explicitly authorized, it naturally would have vetoed that resolution, just as it necessarily would have vetoed the resolution that allowed NATO forces to bomb Gaddafi, leading to his uh, death. Because Russia had approved a resolution at the UN Security Council allowing NATO intervention only on the grounds that it would be limited to preventing a bloodbath in Kosovo. So there is a reason for why Mr. Putin and Mata's council looks at things in a different way. Now when I look at these editorials, I see a replay of the kind of debate that took place during the Vietnam War. And for me, it's reminiscent of the Edmund Burke quote that the law sharpens the mind by narrowing it. Is that a virtue or a vice? Lawyers think that it's a virtue. The basic approach of Madeleine Albright is that legalistic approach that was followed by Eugene Rostow and others. Nothing wrong with it in terms of an intellectual theory. But if you're wrong, there's a price. And the great thing about having an institution like this, which is interdisciplinary, is it teaches you how to evaluate the costs and benefits of action, and not simply to deal with it on principle. Principle is fine. You know that in your own individual spheres. You can have the greatest principles in the world. You can say that I've been wrong in my job. That person is a terrible, terrible man or woman. I'm going to do something about it. But then prudence may dictate, hey, He's stronger than I am. I can't do anything about it now. Maybe I have to wait until he's near a precipice and then I'll gently push him off. But you don't simply act on impulse. So you have aggression. That's about the toughest word that you can use. And you have a Kissinger school that's saying, let's just avoid that kind of language. After reading this, I thought it might be useful to go back and look at some of the earlier writings of Kissinger just to get a better sense of it. And I came across something which I found was rather chilling. Kissinger is trying to end the Vietnam War. And he's working very closely with President Richard Nixon. And they both decide that we need an honorable exit. We can't just seem to be defeated, you know, like a dog running away. Because if we are, we won't be perceived as a great power. If people question our resolve, then we open ourselves up to the use of force by others. And therefore, not that differently from President Obama with the surge in Afghanistan, he ordered a surge in US military activity against Vietnam, directed some uh, a bit through its underbelly, through Cambodia, but it was a military surge and Vietnam saw the writing on the wall and said, it's not worth it. 
and they put out the feelers that it's time for an accord. So picture this, the man who's in charge of unleashing the, the surge against North Vietnam now travels to Hanoi to work out an agreement. And in his memoirs, he describes, or he doesn't describe, he quotes from his own speech that he gave in Hanoi. And I found it remarkable. So here it is. I put it up in my first attempt to use PowerPoint. This was in his book, Years of Upheaval, Upheaval published in 1982. This is the speech that he gave in, in Hanoi. Tell me if you don't find this chilling, because I did. We slid into war. Huh? Slid means we didn't think it through. By the way, you know how many people died in Vietnam? About 40,000 Americans. How many were wounded? The extent of that war? It's a hell of a thing to just slide into war. Do you want to slide into surgery that you don't need? Slide into anything. Slide into war. We slid into war against each other partly through misconceptions on each side. In other words, if we were a little accurate, if we studied history, if we knew a little bit about the facts, we wouldn't have done it. We, the United States, thought the war was directed from one central office that was not in Indochina, meaning Vietnam, and meaning, of course, that we thought it was China or the Soviet Union. And I was wondering, what did the people in Hanoi think? Oh, well, they lost a million people. Imagine that. And all of that because you had this misconception that it was China and the Soviet Union that was directing the war? That's a hell of a price for your misconception. And what about the American soldiers and their families? That's a hell of a price for a misconception. So I put this in the category of the perils or the vice of having a narrow approach. I want to get back to this later on. Because what I would like to do, and I'm just going to ask somebody to signal me when my time begins to run out, if you don't mind. What I would like to do is talk about this in the context of my own professional experiences that revolve around whether it's a virtue or a vice to have a narrow, a sharp but narrow mind. A sharp is a virtue, but what about narrow? And I want to talk about three areas in which I've been involved. In fact, I could almost say three eras. The first deals with individual accountability for war crimes. The second moves from individual accountability to state accountability for the equivalent of war crimes, or worse, for masterminding terrorism and genocide and accountability through the use of international forums. And the third area is state accountability, but not in multilateral fora, but in US courtrooms. So if you will indulge me, I'll go through this. Always in the background, if you would, keep the Edmund Burke phrase. And the question that I asked myself back then about it being a virtue or a vice, and the fact that it may be both or neither, and that there may be some way to combine the two. All right, let's see if I can use this. All right, so first, first, uh, first phase, individual accountability. I had uh, graduated law school in 69, still couldn't figure out what Edmund Burke was really all about, although I had a better sense because I began to read Edmund Burke and I realized that there was a reason that he went from being a lawyer to being a statesman and that what he said was more of a warning than anything else. Um, I then spent uh, some years uh, teaching, tried to get some experience as an attorney, worked in the Justice Department doing appellate litigation, and wanted more hands-on experience as a lawyer in the courtroom. But since I'd been away from the practice of law for so long, I didn't really know the rules of evidence or the like, it would be hard to just become a courtroom lawyer. So I went to 
an individual, a friend of mine from Harvard, Phil Heyman, who had just been appointed as the Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division. And I said, Phil, I'd love to get some, I'm doing appellate work, but it's, it's a little bit like, I don't mean to demean anybody in, acad in academia, but I wanted something, some more action than academic life. And it's like academic life. I spend, you know, it's nice enough. I spend enough time preparing a case. I argue it, I do another case, but there's no blood and guts to it. It's all of 15 minutes. How do I get blood and guts? He said, well, you can't in the criminal division because you don't really know I can't just make you a prosecutor, but there's this new unit that's being set up at the Justice Department called OSI, Special Investigations, and it's going to deal with Nazi collaborators. I said, why is that? It's kind of late in the game for that. This is 1979. I said, yeah, but you know uh, Elizabeth Hulsman? I said, yeah, the congresswoman that did the Watergate, yeah, and Joshua Eilberg, the head of the uh, Judiciary Committee, they're really pressing because we discovered there are a lot of Nazi collaborators, a lot of them in the United States. They came in illegally. They were the heads of concent they, they were the guards at concentration camps. They were the chiefs of police in towns. They were the, uh, the heads of local fascist movements from Romania, Hungary, etc. that collaborated with the Nazis. They're all here and they're pressing to get them out. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to use the immigration laws to do this because under criminal law, we have no jurisdiction over crimes committed abroad. So here's your opportunity, because under immigration law, you don't have to know much about the laws of evidence in criminal law. Uh, it's really like the same standard that's used in a civil lawsuit, which is instead of beyond a reasonable doubt, which is about 90% certainty, it's uh, uh, more likely than not. It's phrased a little bit differently, a little tiny bit stronger in uh, immigration law, but it's essentially that. So you can do it, just hop in. And I thought about it, and uh, I went to see the individual who was gonna head up the office as a dollar a year man, and he was a man named Walter Rockler, who was then the senior partner for tax at Arnold and Porter, and he had done the last of the Nuremberg trials, the banker's case, which held the Dresdner Bank accountable for having provided the money, been the financier for the SS, the Gestapo. And he said to me, look, Alan, you have an opportunity here to really, uh, really tell a story that's never really been told. Just as when I did Nuremberg, the last trial, uh, you know, people didn't know about the role of the bankers. People really don't know. You know, people really don't know how the Holocaust happened. I mean, they know how many people were killed, but they think it's just Germans. You know how few Germans were actually in any concentration camp? I said, what do you mean? I said, let's take Treblinka. A million people were killed there in over a year. How many Germans do you think manned the operation? I don't know, 5,000, 2,000? No, 25 to 40. I said, how can it be just 25 to 40? He said, because they used Ukrainian guards. These were Ukrainian soldiers that had been conscripted into the Russian army, or Soviet army, were captured, and were given a choice, essentially wasn't much of a choice. You could stay in a POW camp where you're likely to starve to death because that's what the Germans were doing, or you can be a guard at Treblinka and uh, shoot anybody who tries to escape, make sure everybody goes to the gas chambers in an orderly fashion. So if you work in this office, you can really get to tell that story because we're going to be going after these people. I said, well, that's a hell of a story. I'd like to tell that story. So I took leave and I, and I went there. But then I learned about the perils of immigration law. Because under immigration law, you don't have a defense that you have in criminal law. In criminal law, you have to have intent. You have to have free will. At least it's a mitigating factor if somebody holds a gun to your head and says, shoot him or I'll shoot you. It may still be manslaughter. But you try to find free will. And what we were doing in the cases that we were doing in deporting people, they would argue that yes, I did not uh, disclose on my immigration form that I assisted the Nazis. But you were a concentration camp guard, that was assisting. I said no, because it wasn't voluntary. So it wasn't really assisting. What I wanted to do was to make the point that it actually was voluntary because number one, you were in the military, you were POWs, every POW, American, Russian, you name it, and any field manual, 
if you have an opportunity, an opportunity to escape, you have to exercise it, or you have to try. And they had ample opportunity to escape, not only because they had rifles, but also because they were given a furlough every two weeks where they were left to go wherever they wanted to. So I wanted to show that because I said, if you really want to do justice to the idea of trying to, to demonstrate what happened, you have to talk about free will. The Justice Department had a very different idea. They said, if you talk about free will, it's going to complicate all of our efforts at dealing with uh, illegal immigration into this country, and it's massive. I said, yeah, but we want to tell a story. He said, no, you ought to go back to academia, Alan. Telling a story is not what, law is, not what real law is about. What real law is about is just getting those bastards. Let's just deport them. And I'm thinking, well, that's good. You know, it's like a guy who says I'm number one because I pushed my way into the train first, but number one in what? Just deporting them without a story just hardly seemed the effort. So I tried quite hard to, uh, to tell the story. And it came down to this. There was one case against a man named Fedorenko, Fedor Fedorenko, which went to the United States Supreme Court. Fedorenko was a 78-year-old man who had been a conscript Ukrainian. When he was a Ukrainian uh, POW, he was given a choice, go to Treblinka or, or starve to death, because about half of his unit had already died of starvation in these POW camps. He went to Treblinka as a guard. He lied about it when he was asked about his past on his visa application. The United States moved to take away his citizenship, and then after they took away his citizenship, they moved to deport him back to the USSR. The USSR, by the way, had provided us with all of our information. They had reason to do so. They didn't like Ukrainians. They didn't like Ukrainians who were of a nationalist bent, not in the United States and certainly not back in the Ukraine, where certain nationalisms were being formed. So we got all of our information from the Soviet, almost all of it, I think all of it really, from the Soviet procurator's office. Um, he argued in his behalf that what he did was involuntary, and he wanted a chance to prove it. The United States government's position was, it doesn't matter if it's voluntary or not. He said that if it doesn't matter whether it's voluntary or not, what about all the Jews who were kapos, the helpers? Because there were 600 Ukrainians in an average in a camp, and there were 600 Jewish kapos, or the ones that had to help the Germans by pushing people into the gas chamber and making sure that everything was orderly. They're all Holocaust survivors. They live in Miami, New York, elsewhere. What about them? And the Justice Department's answer was, we'll exercise our discretion in prosecution. We won't go after them. That never made me feel very comfortable. And I tried very hard when I was at the Justice Department to say that we really have to press the point if you want to actually tell a story that's meaningful. And the story is context. The context is not to keep this narrow, but to make this broad make it broad enough to show that these people had a choice. You know, there's a famous book called Germany, uh, Willing Executioners. People went along with this willingly. If people do things willingly, you learn something from it, especially if it's true and it's damning. And people should have an opportunity to defend themselves if it's not true. Well, Justice Department higher-ups said, we'll consider it. And uh, we have your memo, we'll think about it. For some reason, the Attorney General of the United States, Benjamin Civiletti, decided to argue the case. And when he argued his case, I was sitting not too far behind him, Justice Stevens looked over and he said, in these words, which are from the record, he said, tell me, Mr. Attorney General, in your presentation, you refer neither to Nazis nor to Jews. So tell me, is this a case about historic justice, dealing with the Holocaust, or is it just as easily about illegal Mexican aliens? And the Attorney General responded, it's about the broad enforcement of U.S. immigration laws. At that point, I knew I wasn't made for that office, and I saw in that experience the perils of expanding U.S. laws, like immigration laws, which are inherently limited to deal with matters of crimes committed abroad. And for that reason, I'm very happy today 
that we do have a war crimes tribunals for Rwanda, for former Yugoslavia, and elsewhere that have been set up by the United Nations, and that we have an international criminal court with all of its faults, which gives the United States pause, but at least there is an opportunity because you don't really tell a story unless a person can raise his defense and you try to overcome that defense and show that this was done willingly. So when I left, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do next. Uh, but I had a call from a woman named Jean Kirkpatrick, who was then appointed in 1980 as the US ambassador to the United Nations. And she asked if I could join her, because I had been recommended by my old professor, Eugene Rostow, who was then the head of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. And they were both sitting together at the NSC, and it was right after Israel had bombed the Iraqi nuclear reactor at Osirik. And she was instructed by the State Department to join in a UN Security Council resolution condemning Israel's bombing as, quote, an act of aggression. And she said to Jean Rostow, as she told me later on, you know, Professor Rostow, I am not an international lawyer. I'm a political scientist. But I know enough to realize, even though I do not speak that language, that aggression is a loaded word. And that if someone is deemed guilty of aggression, he has to face a legitimate self-defense response by victims. I also know that aggression does not seem appropriate where there was provocation. And an Iraqi nuclear reactor aimed at Israel seemed a hell of a lot of provocation. And of course, the United States is now very grateful to Israel for having taken out that nuclear reactor when it did, or there would have been real weapons of mass destruction. So I, uh, I joined Gene Kirkpatrick, and the first thing that came up was the battle of law. 60% of the UN's business at that time was taken up by the Arab-Israeli conflict. And regularly, there was an effort made, a consistent effort, to condemn various Israeli practices, not simply as being unhelpful or a hindrance to peace, but as being clearly unlawful, a violation of international law, a violation of the UN Charter. Settlements, well, the United States thought they were a hindrance to peace, but did we want them condemned as a violation of international law? East Jerusalem, Israeli holding on to it, violation of international law, aggression, or just a hindrance to peace, if that was our belief. Uh, the United States ended up vetoing six Security Council resolutions that used the word illegality. We argued that the word illegality is not appropriate because the ultimate aim, which is what Kissinger gets at when he talks about being result-oriented, what is the ultimate aim? Is the ultimate aim simply accountability? Well, it can be in a US court, just put somebody in, in jail, and very often that might be. But the real ultimate aim, certainly in international affairs, has to be reconciliation. But to use the great phrase that Mandela used, truth and reconciliation. We can ask ourselves later on whether that policy was ever pursued in Egypt, whether we, we even try to suggest to any of the parties that they follow in some fashion, in some form, truth and reconciliation rather than retribution. So, um, we um, may, oh, Kirkpatrick made the argument to President Reagan that we have to stay away from, the, from, from this language because it serves simply as a distraction from the cause of peacemaking, which was the ultimate cause. And this was the language that became the official US policy throughout that period. Now, the fact that there is no reference to words like aggression or illegality does not mean that you're impotent. It doesn't mean that you can't condemn action that you think is politically unwise. Because the United States during the Reagan administration continued to talk about settlements, et cetera, as not being productive, or Israel's refusal to recognize the Fourth Geneva Convention as being legally applicable. There are still things you can do short of deeming your opponent aggressor, an aggressor. Now, here's an example. In 1983, 
I don't know how many of you recall this incident. In 1983, there's a Korean airliner named o -O, uh, numbered 007. It has just left Soviet airspace, Sakhalin Island. It's three minutes away, or four minutes. It's clearly outside of Soviet airspace. We know this because we were able to obtain from a ground station in Japan that was monitoring this, the communications between ground control and the pilot. Ground control to pilot, is the airplane out of Soviet airspace now? He says, yes, it's, it's out. Uh, okay, get real close to that airplane. Look into it. Are there civilians on board? Yes, uh, it, there are civilians. Just make sure. We want to know uh, because you know, it could be disguising this airplane to make it look it's civilian and it's actually a, a reconnaissance airplane. No, no, there definitely looks civilians. I said, okay, well, we have instructions to shoot it down anyway. Uh, pilot to ground control. Uh, I want to make sure there's no mistake. I've informed you there are civilians aboard. Your instruction is to shoot it down. Confirmed, Roger, shoot down. Plane is shot down. Everyone is killed. The United States is able to obtain the tape. Question is, what do we do with it? Reagan, having had experience in Hollywood, knows a few things instinctively. You need a good show. This is going to have to be a show at the UN Security Council, which will demonstrate the nature of the Soviet mentality in shooting down this airplane. And they shot it down for one reason. They shot it down because they wanted to teach a lesson to everybody. You violate Soviet airspace, you get shot down. Don't even, don't even fool around with, with going over our space, because we're not going to try to distinguish between a plane that may be engaged in surveillance or a plane that's, uh, that's actually civilian. State Department says, Mr. President, you have to realize, as you must, the Soviets have a veto. If we try to show them, if we try to do something like this, they're going to veto it. He says, I don't care. Put on a show anyway. Where's Kirkpatrick? Oh, she just went to Morocco. Get her back here. She's recalled. I meet her. Intelligence chiefs, community people. They come up with the... Um, what it, what it was then, a VHS, I guess, uh, the transcript. And we fight to get permission from the UN uh, Secretary General to allow us, for the first time in the UN's history, to put up a massive screen. And on that massive screen, we are going to, in what is primitive by today's technological standards, we are going to have on the bottom the transcripts from the Japanese monitoring station that was monitoring this. And we're going to have the equivalent of like little blips showing the airplane, showing exactly where it was, and then playing it as, are there civilians? Yes, shoot it down. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. We did that. We didn't use the word aggression, by the way. We just said this is the true face. Kirkpatrick gave a speech which, which said, here we see the true face of the Soviet Union a country dedicated to mendacity and the rule of force. And discussion and condemnation of Russia goes on for an additional 10 days at the UN Security Council. Its prestige, its standing in the world is really hurt for the very first time because it was on a roll until then. Does anybody here remember what happened when a resolution was introduced by the United States and Britain at the UN Security Council about a week ago, less than a week ago, which, which condemned Soviet action, Russian action, <laughs> Russian quote Soviet action in Crimea. Well, it was vetoed and there was no discussion. There was no fanfare, there was no show. And it's beyond me why with all of our technology, we couldn't have had a show that went on at the UN Security Council so that a story could be told instead of simply inviting a veto and having what's a meaningless record. So there are things that one can do short of using the big words like aggression. And I referred to this earlier. These were the words that the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times used and the difficulty, of course, with using words like a war and aggression is you've got to put up or shut up. 
because you really get yourself into a box. Now, uh, how, much, how much more time do I have? What, 10 minutes? All right, let me move on quickly for the last segment of my experiences that went from individual accountability, state accountability in multilateral institutions, and then state accountability in US courts. You asked that I speak about this, actually, about the Pan Am 103 and the like. Uh, when I uh, went into private practice, somehow the first case that came to me involved families of the victims of the shooting down of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. Shooting down was KL-007. It wasn't shooting down, it was the explosion. It was the bomb. The bomb was originally planted to go off over the Atlantic Ocean, perhaps like the Malaysian situation today, uh, without a trace. So that people could suspect, well, maybe it was Iran, maybe it was Libya, but it would prevent the United States or anyone else from launching an offense against that country, because there were suspicions, because both countries had motivations for doing so. Uh, when I was uh, hired, to handle this case, I try to figure out what could I do. So here we get to the intersection of international law, international relations, I should say, and US law. US law believes in accountability. International relations, unvarnished, can, in the most extreme, believes in no accountability. And the most extreme version of international law, international relations concepts, found their way in to the hoof and woof of US law. Because in 1976, we passed the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Interesting phrase. Doesn't even say foreign countries, sovereigns. Are there still sovereigns around in the 20th century? I mean, people sitting on thrones with scepters. Sovereigns, foreign sovereigns are immune. What does immune mean? Immune means you're accountable to no one, no accountability, zero. You're accountable only to yourself, responsible to no one. Why? Because we want to maintain good relations and because we're afraid that if we sue a foreign country, God knows we may be sued in their country, regardless of the fact that we may not do eh, the kinds of terrible acts that we accuse foreign countries of doing. Anyway, that's the law. And we have reason to believe that Libya is responsible, so much reason that the United States government in conjunction with the UK government files criminal indictments against Libya and Muammar Gaddafi in 1991. Well, I say, all right, I'll take your case, and here's what I'm going to argue. I'm going to go back to my very favorite case in law school, Lady Duff Gordon case. Anybody know that case, Lady Duff Gordon? Judge Justice Cardozo, my great hero, he wrote it in the most beautiful way. And Justice Cardozo, when he was on the Court of Appeals, before he was a Supreme Court Justice in New York, had a case involving a beauty cream that a woman put on her face. Put it all over her face, and the next day she looked like a leper. This, this, it, was, it was manufactured badly, and her whole skin eroded. She looked like a leper. So she brought a lawsuit against the manufacturer. The manufacturer said, there's no warranty that you won't be a leper. She said, well, wait a minute, there's no warranty. I mean, it's just implicit. Certain things are implicit. It's just the nature of things that if you use a cream that it's not going to have that terrible effect on my skin. Uh, district court said, too bad, it has to be explicit. And then in the Court of Appeals, uh, Justice Cardozo gave his famous opinion in Lady Duff Gordon, which was, Lady Duff Gordon was the name of the manufacturer, uh, that certain things are implicit. Certain things are just implicit. It's just common sense. The law can't spell out everything. And it's implicit that there are certain warranties against being turned into a leper if you use a skin cream. And, we, and I argue, well, the same thing holds true here. When the laws of nation were formed, it was based on the idea that it was implicit that you weren't going to bomb each other's aircrafts or each other's ships. And if you do that, 
there would be a waiver of immunity. I made that argument, and I lost it in the district court, and I lost it in the Court of Appeals, which said that the waiver of sovereign immunity must be, must be explicit. It couldn't be implicit. That's about as narrow a ruling as you could imagine. That's about demonstrating that the sharpening of a mind by narrowing it is a vice and not a virtue. Well, then something happened. If you can read the bottom, thanks to Timothy McVeigh in Oklahoma. What does Timothy McVeigh have to do with any of this? Everything is serendipitous, but you have to take advantage of whatever opportunity presents itself. Timothy McVeigh, 1991, I believe, April 11th, is the man who's responsible for bombing with a, with a cohort the Alfred Murrah office building in Oklahoma City. He gets sentenced to death. But in Oklahoma, the average stay on death row is 18 years because you have endless habeas corpus appeals. The families go crazy about this. They say, I can't stand the idea that my loved ones are dead and this man is there in this gym at some uh, correctional facility exercising and being fed at taxpayers' expense. I want an effective death penalty. I want a death penalty over you know, five years, let him exhaust his appeals, but he can't go on like this forever. Pan Am 103 families couldn't care less about Timothy McVeigh and an effective death penalty. It's not on their radar screen. The families of Oklahoma couldn't care less about doing something with regard to eliminating foreign sovereign immunity where a state is accused of terrorism. But as it happened, my second client, Ms. Victoria Cummick, becomes an angel of mercy she travels out to Oklahoma to use her experience to help the families there. And suddenly she realizes, being a political animal, that you know if we put our political forces together, they're trying to lobby on Capitol Hill in order to get an effective death penalty. We're trying to lobby to get an amendment to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to permit suits against foreign governments that sponsor terrorism. Why don't we just go to their congressmen and senators that they're trying, combine it with the ones we're trying, pull it all together, well, they did. And as a result, they got a beast, which nobody knows by its proper name because it's usually called the 1996 Anti-Terrorism Act, but it's not. It's the 1996 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. Where does this fit into the, this whole equation? I'm not quite sure yet, but I think it's an interesting story to tell. After that, we, of course, were able to proceed against Libya after some trials, and it ended up uh, we, we had a resolution whereby Libya paid, as is public information, a settlement of $2.7 billion to the, uh, the 270 uh, families of victims. To the families of 270 victims. After that lawsuit, there was 9-11. Families began to call me. They said, well, why, why can't we do against uh, the perpetrator of 9-11 what you were able to do against Libya. Why can't we sue for massive damages as well? I had no idea who was responsible. Uh, but in time, I discovered that the money trail led to, to the Saudi banks and the Saudi government. Problem was, the only way we were able to get the 96 Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act passed is if we agreed in a political deal with the State Department. <laughs> that even though it's the law, it's not the judges, but well, we will decide whether or not a state belongs on that list. And Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter what they do, we're too friendly with them, they're never going to be on that list. So how do you sue the Saudis? Answer with great difficulty. Uh, that case has not been faring well because any bank, we sued over 200, that has the slightest association with the Saudi government is granted sovereign immunity. The next case was Israelis who began to call me Almost 2,000 people were killed or wounded during what was called the Second Intifada by suicide bombers in Israel, which took place in the mid-1990s and later. And um, they wanted damages against the Arab Bank, which provided incentive payments to suicide bombers. In order for us to have jurisdiction, we had to really demonstrate to the satisfaction of the court that what Hamas, as opposed to the PLO, was involved in was the equivalent of genocidal terrorism. 
The court accepted what we said. We were on a roll. We thought we were going to win. And then this last year, the United States Supreme Court steps in in a totally different case involving Nigeria, Shell, and Kiobo. And there they say, you know, you're suing under the alien tort statute, but we're going to be kind of narrow about this. We're not going to think widely. Nobody knows why it was passed, but we didn't see that it specifically authorized suits against aliens that were corporations. Now, mind you, if you just want to go and commit genocide, if you want to flood their waters, you want to uh, engage in the cyanide poisoning of their, of their wells, we won't hold you accountable if you're a corporation. So if you incorporate, you're okay. But if you're an individual, you will be held liable. Corporations are exempt because we didn't see that language in the original 1789 statute of the Alien Tort Statute. That's about as a narrow thinking as I can imagine, but that's what is the, uh, has almost knocked us out of the water. We're still fighting on this case. Finally, just to show you that one should be an equal opportunity sewer, not just going after foreign governments, why not go after the US government as well? Uh, last year, uh, I was able to, with, in conjunction with other attorneys, but it was my idea, to bring a writ of mandamus action, which is a rare writ that you may study about in law school where a public official is not doing their job properly. And we brought a writ of mandamus against the Secretary of State, uh, Hillary Clinton, arguing that she was not fulfilling her function. She was putting an alleged uh, terrorist organization, the MEK, which is an anti-Iranian organization, on the US terrorism list, which is called FOT, the for T, uh, FTO, Foreign Terrorist Organization, uh, without providing any evidence. And we said that if she's busy, that's just too bad, but you can't put somebody on the list. And unless there is credible evidence that a writ of mandamus should be issued. And it was issued, and the U.S. Secretary of State was forced to take them off the list. <coughs> Finally, the case that breaks my heart, which just happened last week, I sued Yale University for return of a valuable painting, uh, but the questions about how this painting ever was sold to the United States dealt with actions taken by a foreign government, namely Russia. And Yale invoked the, what's called the Act of State Doctrine to prevent a U.S. court from looking at the circumstances involving the taking and the sale of a painting, even though there was no objection from Russia itself. I'm at a loss of time to say anything else, but I think my conclusion is that a, uh, a sharp but narrow mind is a vice. Thank you.